Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Podcast, episode 186, Grab Your Towel. I'm Sean S., your host, and here with me live is the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch with the hype train. <laughs> So tonight, based on the show title, you may have already guessed that we are going to be talking about games for Douglas Adams fans, and I've got some great silly sci-fi game suggestions for you. After that, we've got a review of Chiseled, a game about statue sculpting that I can't think of a clever way to tie to Douglas Adams. I'm sure there's something in there about sculpting or like Slarty Bartfast, we're going to sculpt and instead of sculpting a planet, we're going to sculpt a deck. That, that's about no, no fjords, get. just a deck. No fjords. Yes, there are no fjords in our copy of Chisel. <laughs> After that, we've got a rather short week in review as the start of school has really messed up all of our gaming plans. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Due to taking a week off, we've got a lot of feedback to cover, so let's dive right in. First up, right. a comment on our chiseled unboxing video from Sarah Reed. I do love how the game theme fits with the mechanics of deck deconstruction. The only thing that doesn't mesh is the scoring. It's math-based, but I give it some leeway since it needs to have some way to score, and this works very well. Hope you enjoy playing. Well, thanks for the comment, Sarah. Uh, I found the scoring makes more sense if you think of each card as the number of hours you're going to spend on each part of the statue. So you don't want to spend too much time on the arms and hands because you could chip away too much and they're not even the highlight of the statue and you don't want to ruin them. But most importantly, though, you want to spend the same amount of time on each arm and hands. So you want to only score even points. That's why you don't get points for odd numbers of cards. You have to have an even number because you spend the same amount of time. Now you're going to spend a good amount of time on the body, but the most important part of your statue is the face. That's what draws in everyone's attention. So you want to spend as much time as you can on the face, which is why you want all nine heads when you're scoring faces or heads in chiseled. I found that really helped to make the scoring system actually make some sense. All right. Well, stay tuned for our game room segment later in the show tonight for a more detailed look at chiseled from Grand Gamers Guild. Next, we have Chris Nason, who commented on our Commands and Colors Napoleonics unboxing today. I love them both, though I admit I've played a lot more CNC Napoleonics than CNC Ancients. My war game buddy and I are almost through playing all the standard scenarios from the entire CCN game line. It's been a blast, and we might take a stab at doing the same thing for CCA. That is great to hear, Chris. I still haven't gotten my copy to the table, uh, mainly because I haven't found time to put all those dang stickers on. In the meantime, though, I noticed Commanding Colors Samurai Battles has finally been released. I've been watching that one on P500, and I got to say, I'm already tempted to go out and pick that up. I did add it to all my wish lists already. While Napoleonic Wars honestly do nothing for me, the only reason I'm trying that one out is people tell me it's better than Ancients, I can totally get behind some feudal Japan battles. All right, well, next... A couple of comments on our topic of games where you play the monster. First off, Chris Groff commented, I haven't played a lot of games where you were the monster. King of Tokyo, uh, New York, and Rampage for board games, then for RPGs, various World of Darkness games, and monster cards. Then Todd Foley writes, Monsters, 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 the classic and the first game I ever ran. Two monsters, not three, two monsters. <laughs> Thanks for the comments, uh, both Todd and Chris there. Um, all the games Chris mentioned, we did end up calling out during that episode. And I've got to say, when I sat down to do the research for that episode, I was really surprised at how few games we actually found. Um, the list was almost just like everything I found that sounded like it was a half decent game. I just figured there's more games we had to play Monsters. Now, speaking of Todd's game, we did miss that because I had Monster Monster, which is Monster without the S's which is a card game, whereas Monsters Monsters is actually a really classic role-playing game from 1976 that is based on the original Tunnels and Trolls system that came out like weeks after Dungeons & Dragons did. All right, well, next we have Sneths, 
who commented on our Aventuria core set review to say, I was on the fence for this game for years after playing it at Gen Con. Everything looked great, but just never moved forward. Decided to take the plunge after this review. Well, that's awesome to hear, Sness. Uh, we really do love the game. And it's looking like if you're able to find a copy that at least some people are able to get it here in North America. Now, I know they did have copies at Gen Con this year, Gen Con 2022, but I'm still not seeing it on any of our usual online sources. I keep checking because as soon as it gets back in stores, we're probably going to start talking about that game a lot more. Well, up next, we move to our Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set review and unboxing with these comments. Richard Penwarden says, really enjoyed your unboxing. Also WFRP fan from the 80s, got first edition and more recently fourth. I really love fourth. You are right about those dice. Oh, yeah. And Dwarf Slayer, yes, not a slayer of dwarves. Dwarf, <laughs> species, race and other RPGs, slayer, class. In earlier editions, you are absolutely right. The basic career mm -hmm. was Troll Slayer with Giant Slayer as an advanced career. Yep. Now, every career has four tiers. So the Slayer okay. career is comprised of Troll Slayer, Giant Slayer, Dragon Slayer, and finally Demon Slayer with various skills, talents, trappings, etc. at each tier. Okay. I've got this starter set too, and the reason the character sheets are folded over is because each character has secrets that yeah. the other players may or may not know. If you're passing them around, choosing, people may accidentally see potential spoilers. Okay. Now, finally, Rough Nights and Hard Days says, you mentioned not only as classic adventures, but rules for the pub games and gnome characters. Great oh. job. Gnomes. Did they have gnomes in the original Warhammer? I, I remember halflings. I don't remember gnomes. So. No. I can't even picture a gnome in, in Warhammer what? Fantasy Roleplay. <laughs> gnomes all right well some great info there thank you richard so that's lots of details there about fourth edition uh, the tier system is interesting i wonder if you can still swap careers like if every or if it's just you're a rat catcher then you're an alligator catcher then you're a skaven catcher and then a demon catcher like i want i have no idea who knows well thanks for that either way richard well jacob gorka says no true skavens would say uber three click yes yes okay Sure. <laughs> on another note i've personally been playing warhammer uh since it came fourth edition since it came out and enjoy many aspects combat feels good but i found that the advantage system feels a bit empty but with a bit of house rules it became an awesome rpg system well jacob uh tell you what if you get a chance hit me up with those house rules i'd love to see what you felt needed to be tweaked i gotta say from reading it the advantage system sounded really cool but i haven't actually tried it on the table so may just be flat for us as well now finally helen thomason says every time i shoot my pistol in melee i am hoping the enemy will dodge into the bullet okay sure i guess the opposed roll system for melee can seem a bit odd if you interpret a bad roll as a miss but i think that's more trad game mentality right like a failed roll means a miss if i didn't roll under my weapon skill i missed or sorry in that case ballistic skill um but and, and while, yes, you can interpret it that way, there are other more dramatic and perhaps heroic ways, like the pistol misfire shocking you and more so your opponent who stares at the hole in their left arm. Or while you couldn't quite get a beat on your exact target, you do manage to graze them or something like that. Just because you didn't make the roll doesn't mean your blow didn't land. Yeah, the whole concept of, of success fail based specifically on the over or under that number isn't as much a thing in, in the modern game no. concept. But I said, to me, that seems like a very trad mentality yeah. on it. So let's finish up with a longer comment on our scythe review. Okay. Jacob writes, I tend to get rid of games that don't work for me after the first play. If I can see something in the design, then I'd give it a second go, but that's rare. However, Dominion is the game I'm glad I didn't give up on. Okay. I admit I follow hype and the hype for Dominion was everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think the opinion, Opinionated Gamers review sold me on Dominion first. It was my first deck builder. After I got it, my first player play say, had me saying, what? <laughs> I didn't understand the hype. I was playing it correctly, but I didn't get it. Yeah. Taught it to a second group, hoping for more, and it was just strange that a game with this much praise was so flat for me. I'd paid good money for it, so I played it a third time with <laughs> a new group. It was more fun in terms of we were enjoying our time together 
and doing everything correctly, but we didn't get the point of it. Wow. Fourth game, I was again playing with new people, and this time I subconsciously had in intent with everything I did. I didn't mean to thrash them, but I did. I realized then that I understood how deck building works and the genius of Dominion. That was a clarifying moment I'll never forget. I now own all the expansions. Wow, thanks so much for that, Jacob. Uh, this is exactly the effect I had with Scythe, which I'm starting to now just call the Scythe effect when it happens with other games, because now that's happening with me with all the bus, Doors of Cartagena. And I'm just glad you were willing to give Dominion another shot, because it turned out to be a game you love. And I love that story. It's, it's, it's great that you had that eureka moment where it just clicked. And that's honestly kind of what happened with Scythe, that one ridiculously long six and a half hour game. By the time we were done that, so much made way more sense than when I played the game before. And that's where we're going to stop today. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions, working with you to make your game night better. Tonight's question comes from Daniel S., who writes, I need a suggestion for a gift for a couple who like board games and Douglas Adams, but okay. who already have many of the obvious ones. Any good ideas? Well, thanks for the great question, Daniel. Um, now, when I hear Douglas Adams, the first thing I think of is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That was the main thing I read from Adams, and I read it cover to cover and devoured it all. Then I think of Dirk Gently, uh, which has some sci-fi elements with the time travel and stuff like that. And while well, the fact that he worked on a number of classic Doctor Who episodes, which I'm now discovering because I've been watching classic Doctor Who and seeing Adam's name pop up fairly regularly. Now, this all points me looking at those three licenses to silly, ridiculous, funny sci-fi games. So those are the type of games we're going to focus on tonight. And while I've been a huge Adams fan for many years since I started on the guide back in grade school, <laughs> and now I believe I have three different versions, including the radio script. Yeah, that's impressive. My first experience was actually the TV show on the BBC. I remember that one and the, the ship and the probability drive disappearing and everything. I didn't actually read the books until university, uh, particularly in Professor Gold's math class, if I remember correctly, <laughs> which probably wasn't the best thing. Now, the other part of Daniel's question calls out that they are looking for a gift for a couple. So this also means games that are good for two players. Now, uh, silly and two player and sci-fi, I think it's going to be a little too limited for our game list tonight. So instead of limiting it to two player games and games good with two, I think instead we're just going to call out how each game recommendation would play with two. That way our list is more useful for a wired range of game groups while still answering the question. Now, before we get to Mo's list, I do want to note that oddly, there isn't a single actual licensed game out there based on the Hitchhiker's Guide, at least in board game form. Yeah. Really, except for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text-based adventure that some of us grew up with, mm -hmm. uh, arguably the Starship Titanic, also from Adams, and a fan-made card game whose print-and-play files were lost when Angel Fire shut down. <laughs> there aren't any official games based on Hitchhikers. Which is just weird to me. Like, like how? How is there no Hitchhikers Guide game? Like, there, it just seems ripe for party games or a silly sci-fi game, or there's no role-playing games either. Like, there's just none. I would expect at least there was a TV show. Why was there not a BBC board game with, you know, roll to move six and I move four prefix six spaces on the board and then I draw a random card? Well, Adams was a huge computer fan. He yeah. was a computer geek. And a lot of the actual uh, discussions of uh, sort of how um, uh, how people interacted with computers in uh, Hitchhikers were born from his own fascination yeah. with computers. And that's where we got the text adventure. And the reason why Starship Titanic didn't actually really come out for the ma most people until 2015 because mm -hmm. the actual conversation engine he was designing was simply too complex. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's not to say there are no games actually based on Adam's work, though. There right. is a party game in the Everything is Connected series based on BBC America's Dirk Gently, the TV series. This is a card-driven storytelling pitch game where the holistic detective tells their solution to a mystery, then the police detective tells their story 
and the other players vote on whose story is better. The roles then shift around the table. So there you have it, I guess. Our, our first game suggestion would be an actual Douglas Adams based game, would be Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, Everything's Connected, published by IDW Games. Though I should point out that that TV show is well post uh, Douglas's death and yes. lo loosely connected with, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with the official Dirk, Gent Dirk Gently writings. But since that's all we have for official licensed games, what silly sci-fi games do you think Douglas Adams fans should check out? All right, so the first game that came to mind to me when I was thinking about this topic was Galaxy Truck. Now, this is a real-time tile-laying game where you're a trucker shipping sanitary pipes across the galaxy. Yes, you're shipping sewage pipes. In order to save money, the company you work for came up with a brilliant idea to make it ships out of said pipes. And I've got to say, that theme could totally come out of a Douglas Adams book. Now, actual gameplay involves players building their ships real-time out of tiles, then launching them on a journey, dealing with all kinds of hazards and hoping they arrive at their destination, at least somewhat intact, and maybe with a little bit of bonus cargo to pick up some money along the way. Now, I've been a fan of this game since it first came out, and it was recently re-released in a new updated edition with, catch this, a cheaper price point. What about two players? Does the Galaxy Trucker work with two? Well, since there isn't a lot of player interaction, other than the fact that you're drawing from the same pool of tiles, and you can draft tiles your opponents choose not to take, I've found Galaxy Trucker plays pretty much the same, no matter how much the player count is. Yes, there's a bit more competition for harder to find parts, and when you reach your planets, you're generally going to get better stuff with only two players, but I don't think you need more than two players to have fun playing Galaxy Trucker. And that was Galaxy Trucker. That's from CGE. I forgot to toss in the uh, the publisher there. I think I did that for the rest of these. So we'll try to correct that if we miss them. Now, the next game that came to mind for me was Star Flux. Well, actually, it was just Flux. And I went, there's got to be a sci-fi version. So I looked up the various versions of Flux. And while I'm not a huge fan of this game myself, but they're, they're to me, they're too silly and too random. It's kind of like playing the infinite probability drive in a card game. Uh, but I get it. Groups love Flux. I know many gaming groups that love Flux. They, most of them also love imbibing alcoholic beverages at the same time. But it's cheap price point and accessibility. This could be a perfect gift for even non-gamers. Flux is one of those super simple card games. If you don't know it, the game starts with two rules. All it tells you is you draw one card, then you play one card, and that's it. Now, the fun comes from changing those rules with new rule cards. Now, that's how Flux was introduced to me, but I think the big thing that sells it is that once you start playing, you realize it's actually about managing to have the right keeper cards in play, matching a goal card in your hand. I wish someone had explained it that way to me because I was just so lost the first game changing rules for no reason. Knowing what the end goal is does really help. Now, as mentioned, there are tons of versions of Flux out there, though again, no official Douglas Adams based ones. Now, I recommended Star Flux because it's generic sci-fi, but if you prefer a specific license, there's Star Trek, Star Wars, and Firefly. Plus, there's even educational ver editions like Astronomy Flux. And well, Firefly uh, Flux could certainly, uh, uh, you know, settle in with some of the comedy of sci-fi yes. aspects. Now, two players, what about that? Well, for a game basically designed for big groups up to six, I actually find Flux plays better at lower player counts and can be quite cutthroat with only two. My only complaint, though, is without more players taking turns, the randomness of the deck can come into play more. And it's very common for someone to win just based on a lucky draw. But that's all part of playing Flux. And that was Star Flux from Looney Labs. Now, sticking with light, silly card games, my next recommendation is Star Munchkin. This is the sci-fi version of Steve Jackson's classic card game, where you're trying to get your character to level 10 by kicking down a door, fighting some monsters, and stealing their loot. Early in the game, players need to work together in order to overcome tougher foes. But once anyone starts getting close to level 10, the gameplay shifts and becomes all about backstabbing your previous allies and preventing them from getting to the top. Of all the Munchkin games, this is actually one of my favorites. I love the card combos and races in the game and particularly love the laser phaser dazer system, as I like to call it. There's a system where you can actually combine weapon cards and just keep stacking them on top of each other. While the take that nature of this game won't be for everyone, there's a lot of people out there that love the Munchkin series of games. 
So now, will this work for a geeky couple? Unfortunately, no. This is where Munchkin falls flat. It does require three players to play. And yes, there are some house rules out there for playing with two, but honestly, they're not great. In this particular case, you need at least three players and would be better off with four. Sorry, Daniel. And that was Star Munchkin from Steve Jackson Games. Next up, I've got Junk Orbit. Now, the premise here is that one planet's trash is another planet's treasure. Here you're playing a scavenger who goes around picking up space junk and delivering it to, well, anywhere that will take it. Now, the most fun bit here is the same junk that you're picking up and delivering is also what gets your ship moving by ejecting it out the airlock in the opposite direction that you want to move. Cute theme, cute art, and a very well done movement system. To me, this again sounds like something out of a Douglas Adams book. But does it play well with only two players? I'm so glad you asked, Sean. <laughs> I would say yes. Actually, it plays great with two. Uh, Deanna and I have played this together both um, a few times, and we both had a lot of fun. That said, the game is better with more players. Great with two, but better with more all the way up to five. With the sweet spot being three if you ask Board Game Geek users. And that was Junk Orbit from Renegade Game Studios. So next up, I've got an area majority game. So before you even have to ask, it does not work well with only two players. It's area majority. You really need three players for any majority game to really work. Now, this game is Mission Red Planet. It's an anachronistic game set in a Victorian era Earth where you are leading a mining team to Mars. It's the artwork, flavor text, and background for this one that makes me think it's a good pick for Douglas Adams fans, as well as it being a very straightforward and easy to learn area majority game. Like to me, this is the gateway area majority game to teach that mechanic to a new player. Now, each player starts with the same set of crew members in card form and will play one of them each turn in order to load rockets, change rocket destinations, move miners between ships, sabotage other players, etc. Now, it's only the players with the most other people in each sector of Mars that will get to mine the valuable resources they're in. So you can't play this with uh, one or two players at all? So, technically, if you own the second edition of Mission Red Planet, which at this point is pretty much the only version you should be able to find, it introduced the two-player variant. Thing is, we tried it. And it works, but it's nothing like playing the regular game with more than two. It's one of those completely changes up the rules of the game. Each player is playing two different colors, a main color and a neutral color. The neutral color, you just randomly determine which card they're using, and they basically just mess with everyone's majorities. And then the worst part is at the end of the game, if either of the neutral colors has the most points, both players lose. So it's a two-player game where you can both lose. I was just not a fan of it. And that was Mission Red Planet from Fantasy Flight Games. Have you ever wanted to know what it feels like to be the bridge crew of your own starship? Well, Space Cadets may be the game for you. Join Star Patrol and choose a role from Helmsman, Engineer, Weapons Officer, Shield Officer, Sensor Officer, or Captain. Each role will be playing their own unique mini-games as the Captain tries to direct everyone to complete your assigned mission. This game is silly, fun, and frantic. Uh, it's one of those games where everything's going wrong. And because of that, it's not going to be for everyone. Also, it's real time. So you have the captain yelling at you to fix the engine while the shield guy is asking you for more energy from the energy guy and the helm officer is trying to avoid an asteroid when they don't have enough power to get it done. And also, before you ask, no, this one doesn't even work with two players, sadly. It's best with at least five. That way, all the rules get covered and all the mini games are in play. And that was Space Cadets from Stronghold Games. My next silly sci fi game suggestion is Clank in Space. Now, due to the fact the background and cards all parody a wide range of sci fi tropes, all from the realms of science fiction, including Douglas Adams. Now, I wouldn't call this game laugh out loud funny, but there's definitely some humor to be found in the theming and the cards. Now, this is a deck building game where you're trying to sneak and board Lord Eradicus's spaceship, snatch and grab some artifacts and get out via one of the escape pods. The problem is that it's far too easy to make a lot of noise while exploring, and that can draw the attention of the evil lord himself or his lackeys. 
Now, I actually love everything Clank, with this particular version featuring modular boards and some interesting mechanics to make sure players don't just sneak in, grab the first thing, and get out, which was a potential problem with the original Clank. Now, does this one work with only two Space Thieves? It does. Actually, most of my plays of Clank in Space were with only two players, though I will say it's better with three. Excuse me. Though I will say it's better with three. I do prefer two over four, though, as the game can get long at the longest, highest player counts. And that was Clank in Space from Renegade Game Studios. Now, my final silly sci-fi game is all about factory management AIs getting really bored. So setting up races between the shop floor robots. That game is Robo Rally from Richard Garfield of Magic the Gathering fame. Actually, it was his money from Robo Rally that let him print his card game. Now, this is a ridiculous program movement game where you're trying to be the first to get your robot to hit all of the checkpoints while moving over a map covered with pits, lasers, conveyor belts, turning gears, crushers, flamethrowers, and a ton more obstacles. Now, there's a trick with this one, though. What you really want is the original version of the game, published by Avalon Hill, that came in a red box with metal robots and not the much cheaper, much poorly produced uh, version released recently from Hasbro. Now, the Hasbro version is still fun. It's, it's solid, but it's simpler, I, which I guess is better for younger players and non-gamers. But it's just not as silly and over the top as the original and not nearly as much variability. Now, one more tip. Got to tell anyone who plays Robo Rally, especially if you find the original and the expansions, you got all these map tiles, keep most of them in the box. We strongly recommend you don't go nuts and use more than two maps. One or two boards, especially zigzagging back and forth, is actually the most fun, as the game can drag on if you have too many maps. You know what I want to know. All right, so this is a tough one. Most people would say you need at least three to enjoy Robo Rally, and in most cases, I agree. One of the problems with this game is that if someone gets too far ahead, especially if multiple maps, it can be hard to catch up. And that's actually one of the reasons when you're designing your checkpoints, you should zigzag so the robots have to cross each other because that way everyone's kind of close enough to each other. But anyway, uh, with three or more players, when someone's in the lead, at least everyone else can kind of gang up on that player to try to catch them. Whereas when you're two players and someone's, it's a race, right? Someone's just so far ahead, you can get to that point where you can never catch up or at least it feels that way. Now that said, I have had some fantastic two-player games where the players are evenly skilled and it becomes a neck and neck race and a frantic fight to the finish. So that one, that's a tough one. And that was Robo Rally, currently by Hasbro Games. But if you can, you want to find the Avalon Hill version. Now, this is a game I would love to see a new edition come out, hopefully bringing it closer back to the original game. Oh, I said I said final twice. I'm sorry. I have one more. <laughs> I have one more. Uh, my final recommendation, which I think is perfect for a couple looking for some sci-fi silliness, I did this in the last minute because uh, Deanna recommended it, is the Mars Attacks the Miniature Game. This is a two-player only skirmish miniature game from Mantic based on the Mars Attack franchise, and it includes all the silliness that goes with that. This includes overpowered everyman human heroes and things like flaming cows running across the battlefield. Yes, I own a set of flaming cow miniatures for this game. They come in the box. Now, the thing with this is that it's also a fantastic miniature game. Honestly, one of the best I've ever played. It uses the system Mantic created for Dead Zone, which is their most popular game. Now, it uses D6 dice and, or D8 dice instead of D6, so you've got a bit more variability. But the real shining point in this is a grid-based movement system and line of sight rules. That means you don't need any rulers or measuring tapes to play this while still staying a tactical skirmish game. Honestly, I love this game. But there's a huge problem. It's gone. It's long out of print. And I mean, like, really out of print. Like, if you go to Mantic's website and you click on products, it's not even listed there anymore, which is a shame. This is a game I wish more people had tried because I think they would have liked it. Even if they didn't care for the, the actual theming or the license, I think it was a fantastic miniature game that sadly I don't think got the chance it could have. It, it should have had. Now, since this is a two-player skirmish game, we know it's great for couples. Yes, exactly. So I guess the opposite question is, can you play with more than two? And as written, no, but the way the hero characters work, I could totally see playing with more people 
where each player is playing their own hero. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. Or perhaps playing one versus many, where you have one player playing the Martians and then a group of players each controlling different heroes. And that was the sadly out of print Mars Attacks, the miniature game from Mantic. Next, we move on to some honorable mentions for you tonight. These are games that neither of us have had the pleasure of playing, but look like they could be perfect for Douglas Adams fans. So the first game is Space Team, the card game. Now, I love Space Team, the app. It's an Android app. I think it's also on Apple. If your game group has not played Space Team and you're into sci-fi stuff at all, before your next game night, you should all go download it and play a game before you break out whatever tabletop game you're going to play. It's really that fantastic. Now, the thing is, there's a Space Team card game. And when doing research for this topic, I found it on a lot of top sci-fi board game lists. So many that I figured I had to include it here. If this game has half the fast-paced, fun time of the app, it should be an amazing time in, in, in card game format. So as Sean noted, it is a party game. So best with groups of four or more. And that was Space Team from Stellar Factory. Next, I have Attack of the Jelly Monster. Now, this game builds itself as a chaotic tactical party game, which are four words you don't usually see together. Uh, it's a real-time simultaneous play dice game with the theme of defending your town that's being attacked by a giant jelly monster, and you need to rush around town and gather up as many samples as you can with your squad. Interestingly, despite that theme, this is not a cooperative game. Instead, you're all competing squads, each trying to be the team that can take credit for saving the town. Probably not the best way to defend your town from a jelly monster, but hey. Uh, now, I see this one on sale all the time, so you should be able to get this one cheap. And as for today's question, though, this one will, won't will work with two players. This is a minimum of three. But it could be some silly fun for a bigger group of Douglas Adams fans. And that was Attack of the Jelly Monster from Asmodee. Our final honorable mention is The Captain is Dead. While this one is clearly based on Star Trek, it lists Douglas Adams as an inspiration as well. In this game, you play the crew of a starship who in the last 10 minutes of the episode, the captain is killed off, and the remaining crew need to band together to save the day. This is a cooperative game for two to seven players that I have heard a ton of good things about. Heck, this was nominated for the 2018 Origin Award for Best Board Game of the Year. This is actually on my personal wish list and something I really want to try. It sounds like a lot of fun. As for playing two players, you may not want to do that. The box says two to seven, but the Board Game Geek users have listed this as a three to seven player game that's best with four or five. Now, the other thing I noticed on Board Game Geek that makes me want this even more is the weight. This is not like a weight one or two party game. This is like a 3.75. So I'm even more interested. I really want to check this game out. And that was The Captain is Dead from AEG. Now that's it for our list of silly sci-fi games that should be a treat for any Douglas Adams fans. What's your favorite silly sci-fi game? Did it make our list? If not, we'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Chiseled, a deck sculpting card game. Thanks to Mark from Grand Gamers Guild for shipping us up a copy of this from Gen Con to review. A Chiseled was designed by Michael Epstein and features artwork from Nate Bersotti, Jason Butera, Tatiana Quigley and Al Sway was published in 2020 as a joint effort by Grand Gamers Guild and Copper Frog Games. This is a one to four player deck deconstruction card game that plays in under half an hour once you've figured out the scoring system. <laughs> this small box card game has an MSRP of $29.99 US. So in Chiseled, you take on the role of a sculptor about to start work on your next masterpiece. Your deck represents your block of stone, and you're going to use various tools to remove cards from that deck, hoping to be left with a perfect sculpture that also impresses three randomly determined critics. 
For a look at what you get with a copy of Chiseled, we invite you to check out our Chiseled unboxing video on YouTube. Uh, there you'll see the game comes in a small box that contains a simple four slot plastic box insert uh, to hold the four player decks and other cards. You get a clear and concise rule book, some useful two sided player boards, and that's pretty much it. The player boards are notable as they feature two different ways to calculate your score at the end of the round. You mm -hmm. can either cho choose to score what's left in your deck or what's in your trash pile. The math on these is identical, but some players will find one method more intuitive than the other. Yeah, I also thought this was really cool. And when we play, different players will often choose different ways to use the scoring sides. Uh, now, the main component here, though, in this game are the cards. So these are of excellent quality. And they've been holding up really well to lots of shuffling. This is a deck builder. You will go through your deck probably at least once, if not twice. Now, the iconography on the cards is very clear, and the card design is quite brilliant, but it might take you a bit to get used to knowing where to look for what and what everything represents. My only actual complaint about quality here is the fact there's one promo card for this game, and it's not the same size as the other cards. But that's not something going to matter for anyone who just picks up the box set. Okay, now that you know what you get with Chiseled, let's move on to an overview of play. All right, so you start a game at Chiseled by randomly dealing out a number of tool cards to the center of the table, nine for four players or seven for any other player count. Then each player grabs their own deck and a player mat. The deck of critics is then shuffled, three are dealt face up so everyone can see them. Everyone then takes a check-in timer card and then takes one of the unused critics and puts it on top, pointing at the five slot. This card also works as a rules reference as well as a timing mechanism. That's pretty much it. This game is super simple to get set up and playing. That said, this is the setup for a basic game. The mm -hmm. game also includes the Sincera or Without Wax expansion. When using this, players will also shuffle in an equal number of wax cards into their deck, or 12 if playing solo. Now the last thing everyone does before the starting player goes is to draw three cards from their deck. Then the player with the most chiseled chin goes first. Or just use Schwazi or some other method to determine who goes first. Each turn, you're going to select one of the face-up tools, the tool cards that are in, in play. You will do what it says on the card, then flip it face down. If all the tool cards are face down, you flip them all back over. You then discard any remaining cards in your hand and draw a new set of three cards. If your draw pile is empty, of course, you're going to shuffle your discard and it becomes your new draw pile, just like every other deck builder. Now, if the hand of cards you're left with at the end of your turn contains three sculpture cards, you're going to advance that critic track. If it reaches the end of the track, every other player gets one more turn and the game ends. Honestly, that's it. Pick a tool, use it, discard, and draw. It really couldn't be simpler. What's missing from this description, though, is exactly what all the different tools mm -hmm. do. They are the meat of the game and include, include a number of different ways to remove cards from you or your opponent's decks. These include the flat chisel that has you draw three cards off your draw pile and trash or, and scrap any stra scrap that's drawn. The mallet that has you trash all the cards in your hand. The rounded chisel that lets you trash all the cards of one type from your hand. And more, including my favorite, the mm -hmm. saw that has you name a material type and start flipping off uh, cards from your deck and trashing until you find the material type you picked. Now, knowing what cards are in your deck will also help this make a little more sense. Your deck is made up of three different types of sculpture cards. There's arms, bodies, and heads. Each of these comes in three different materials, onyx, silver, and gold. There are nine cards of each type split into the three of each material. So you got three gold arms, three onyx arms, and three silver arms. Your deck also has 18 scrap cards in it. Now, once any player's critic track hits zero, the game ends. Again, everyone else gets one more turn. You go to scoring. Now, to get to the maximum points, you want your deck to contain exactly two arm cards, five body cards, and nine heads, and no scrap. Now, the player boards show the score you get for these amounts, as well as other combinations, if you didn't get the perfect sculpture. Now, it's worth noting, arms are only worth points if you have an even amount. Any scrap still in your deck scores negative points. Finally, if you are using that Sincera variant, wax cards are worth one point each for every player, except for the one who has the most wax in their sculpture. Instead, they're worth minus one for that player. Now, I know it sounds silly, and silly that you want nine heads on your statue at the end of the game, but it helps to think about it like this. 
Each card left in your deck represents how much time you're spending on that part of your statue, mm -hmm. say an hour per card. So you don't want to waste too much time working on the arms. They aren't the focal point of the statue, but you do want to make sure you spend an equal amount of time on both sides. Mm -hmm. So you want to spend an even amount of hours on them. The body is going to take a lot more work. You need to spend more time on that, but again, not too much. You don't want to overwork it. And then you get to the head and face, which is the most important part of your statue. And you want to spend as much time as possible on this part. Yeah, when you think of scoring and chiseled this way, it makes a lot more sense and doesn't seem quite so abstract. Now, we already mentioned above, but when scoring, you can do things one of two ways. You can look at what's left in your deck, as we just described, or you can look at what's in your trash pile. In this case, you're looking to have seven arms, four bodies, and no heads in your trash. Now, once you've scored your statue, there's one more thing to do, and that's check in with the critics. Now, remember, at the start of the game at the setup, there are three critic cards laid out. These are going to award players bonus points based on what's in players' trash piles. The critic awards are based on materials, what materials you used on your statue with various points being awarded for things like having more onyx than gold or having the most silver out of all the players, having an even amount of scrap and so on. Once you add any critic bonus points to everyone's statue points, the player with the most points wins. It's also worth noting that you can play this solo and just try to beat your top score. There is a solo score chart that will give you a ranking. If you are using the expansion, every wax card is worth minus one point. To make things more interesting, there is a card of solo challenges you can also use, which includes three challenges to make the game more difficult and interesting. I will admit this isn't a game I really enjoyed solo. It's much more fun to have more players. Uh, that way you're more limited in which tools you can use, because that's a big part of the game, and especially that last tool being stuck with it is something that's not going to happen when you're playing just by yourself. So it sounds like it's time to move on to our final thoughts on Chiseled from Grand Gamers Guild. So back when deck building was a pretty new thing and the interest industry was starting to get flooded, honestly, with various Dominion variants. And one of the primary strategies of most of those games at that time was to thin your deck down as much as possible to make a super sleek engine that you can just keep running over and over again. And at that time, I remember having the idea that it would be really cool that that, if that was the game, was just getting your deck as thin as possible. A game where you start with a super fat deck and the actual goal is to streamline it. Well, I gave this concept some thought and over time, I never did really come up with anything other than the concept. And now here we have Chisel and while well, technically Xenon Profiteer before it, we have someone else using that entire concept brilliantly. Though I gotta say they call it depth sculpting instead of deck building or reverse deck building or deck shedding. And that's why you can't patent game mechanisms. Yes, that's true. Now, the most impressive thing Chiseled has done to me is perfectly integrate the theme. What a brilliant idea for deck deconstructing. Your deck is your block of stone. You use tools to remove cards from it. Like that's top-notch design for integration of theme and mechanics. Then you toss in the scoring system, which I love. Once you start thinking of hours spent and the critics being thrown in there and the theme just gets tied in even more i actually can't think of many games that are this well theme integrated heck a few weeks back we talked about immersion in board games on our podcast and i've got to say there's some of that actual immersion happening here because you are literally sitting there choosing which tool to use to best sculpt your deck you're dealing with you you have on hand and if you use the wrong tool things can go horribly wrong and as with reality, you don't quite know the exact makeup of the material in the block you're working with. Yeah. So the wrong tool can gouge out your vision for the statue. And as for gameplay, it's just pretty brilliant. The deck sculpting system works and works well. So are there some things that might take a bit to click in? Um, I found with experienced deck building players that players have a hard time dealing with the fact that you're not actually playing the cards in your hand. Everyone who's played any deck builder before wants to play the cards in their hand and wants to play them in a set order and set up combos and that. The cards in your hand are only there to be either discarded to your discard pile or track. Nothing else. It's not the cards in your deck that do things here. It's the tool cards. And it's the theme integration that really helps push people into that realization. The mm -hmm. first time you saw through half of your deck, you can't help but get it. That's 
Uh, then, of course, there's the Sorry system, which everyone box at at first. I, at least now that I've got a way that it makes sense to me, like I've, we've got our own head cannon for how scoring works in Chiseled. Now, when I teach the game, I explain it that way and people tend to grok it. But I got to admit, I was confused at first. Trying, Why do you want two arms, five bodies and nine heads? Like before reading the rules, I just assumed when you were when I bought this game that I was going to be trying to do two, two and or sorry, two, one and one. Like this isn't sculpting Cthulhu after all. <laughs> So time spent just ends up feeling right. Yeah. Now, my only real complaint about Chiseled is that it can start to feel a bit samey after quite a few plays. Now, this did take quite a few plays to get there. There are only 13 different tool cards, and with four players, you're using nine at once. So it's not going to be long before you've seen all the cards. And while, yes, different sets of tools and different combinations do change up the way the game plays and what you can do, the overall feeling really doesn't shift much. Now, the critics do get mixed up as well, but honestly, I find that the critics aren't nearly as important as the tools that are in play. I agree. The critics don't materially change the game nearly as much as one might think. They certainly don't make it entirely different from no. game to game. At best, maybe influencing a tool choice now and then. Yeah. Now, this is hap a game that I will happily play one or two, maybe even three times in a row, but then I won't touch it for a month or so only to bring it back out and play a couple more times in a row. Now, what I would love to see to battle this is an expansion, either just some more tools or perhaps some legs, right? Like to me, that's what's missing in this game. Where are the legs? I add a whole set of legs to the deck, nine different legs and nine in and, and three different metal types. And I don't know how many legs you need, but I think it would have to be like, the, maybe you need an odd number of legs. I don't know. Something to make it interesting, though. I'll have a hard time coming up with a time explanation for that. Now, the Sin Sarah expansion does help, uh, actually. I, it, it, I enjoy the bit of take that that gets added to this game, but I don't recommend using that plane with only two players. It just gets too nasty. It's, it's too easy to just flood your opponent with wax and take the extra points. While I agree this would be fun to expand, and I expect rather easy to, I'm not sure how it would increase that replayability. Uh, yeah. and it might still get sh shelved from time to time after three or four plays. Yeah, that's true. Even if you toss some legs, I'll probably just play like about 10 games in a row when I've got the legs and then I'll be like, oh, legs are just another thing. Overall, I love that this game exists. This is one of the best tie-ins of a theme to game mechanics I've ever seen. And I love seeing that someone else was able to come up with a brilliant way to make deck shedding work. Way better than I came up with. While the scoring system might see a bit odd at first, everything about about sh that chiseled. I almost said chiseled. That's now an SH. Everything else about chiseled is excellent from the component quality to the gameplay. While I can get sick of it if I play too many games in too short a time period, this is a game I end up returning back to after a break. Like right now, and while I was working on the show notes earlier in the week, I was talking about it. And I'm like, no, I, I might just need to bring chiseled to Brenda's this weekend. Because I feel like playing it again. I could see uh, that as a sort of appetizer game at the start of a weekly game night, mm -hmm. perhaps waiting for the last players to arrive or just as a warm up. Totally see that. Now, if you dig deck building, you really should check out Chiseled. It takes a mechanic you love and flips it upside down in a really brilliant way. Now, if there's an actual sculptor in your game group or if you've got a friend who's a sculptor, who's at least casually into games, this could make a really cool gift. I honestly think someone who's actually worked stone will find the concepts in here just make a lot of sense and would make for a fun gaming experience. Now, if you hate deck building, I think you should give Chiseled a shot. Don't go and buy a copy, but like find a friend with a copy, do a demo, see if a local game store or a cafe, or a local cafe has a copy. You may just find that it's way more fun removing cards from a deck than it is adding. And lastly, for Take That fans, before to try with the wax, with the without wax, the says Sarah variant, you're going to love toxing those wax cards into your opponent's discard piles while racking up some bonus points yourself. And that pretty much covers it. And yeah, I, I guess I just pretty much recommended the game for everyone. And I'm not ashamed of that. This really is a fascinating, unique and fun card game. Well, that's it for our review of Chiseled, the deck sculpting card game. Have you ever come up with a mechanic but failed to make it work only to see someone else do it brilliantly? Well, tell us all about it in the comments below. 
Uh, before I go, I do encourage you to like, share, subscribe, or follow, depending on where you are hearing, seeing, or watching this. Uh, doing so really does help more people find our content. And I'd also like to invite you to check out my written review of Chiseled over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So while there wasn't any game playing this week to speak of, uh, Azul on Board Game Arena was pretty much it for me. Uh, what I did get done this past week were seven board game unboxings, and I gotta say, I am hyped about a few of these. You can look forward to seeing these being released once a week on YouTube in the coming weeks. So up first was Viticulture World. Of note here was the fact Stonemeyer has now swapped to using more green products in their com publishing and in their games. Uh, this included biodegradable baggies and paper strips instead of shrink wrap on cards. Well, I do commend the environmental effort. I really do. I appreciate it. Those bands didn't really do a very good job of keeping things sorted. My box was a bit of a mess when I opened it. Though that's hardly a huge issue, we're just used to more perfect reveals, even if it's not strictly necessary in any way. Yeah, though this particular one is a little frustrating just because there's different card sets and I couldn't tell which cards actually belong with which. Though I'm sure going through the inventory in the start of the book would probably explain it clearly. Now it's going to be a while before I get to review this one or it even gets played because first I'm going to have to reteach myself and my group Riticulture. It's been a long time. Uh, next up were two Perilous Pursuits escape room games. Um, these were super quick as there wasn't much in them that I could show without spoiling things. Or maybe I should have shown everything. I don't know. I didn't show much of it. Tried to show off the quality more than the contents. Uh, these were very well presented. Um, I was expecting more of the you get an envelope and there's a bunch of stuff shoved in it. Where these were actual, you know, board game quality boxes with like a nice introductory sheet telling you where to get started with pretty solid quality stuff. And honestly, I wasn't even sure if we should release the unboxings, but the fact that no one else has ever done one, I think we'll put them out there because maybe we'll be the only ones. Now, these are going to be going over to Brenda's to play because she is the one that loves the mystery escape room puzzle games, and we'll be playing those together over at her place. As for when, who knows, but we'll probably split them up. I, I should, I think I'm going to review them both separately, but we'll see. Maybe we'll put them, lump them together. And you do certainly seem to be getting known for the escape room type puzzle games. Yeah. I, I, well, I said, I, I thank Deanna's mom for that one. She's the one that loves them. So uh, next, I cracked open Smash Up Disney, which looked pretty much like I thought it was going to look like a tray and lots of cards and some counters. Um, what really baffled me, though, were these extremely well-made, super thick printed dividers that don't fit anywhere in the box. Turns out these are for people who own the big geeky box, which is apparently the the collectors, you know, the big fans of Smash Up. This who is own everything, they keep all of their stuff in. Uh, and so any new sets that release have to have these dividers or the big, big geeky box, box people won't be able to separate all their cards. So I, I guess I, I guess if you owned the big geeky box, you'd be like, oh, the new set doesn't have dividers. But I don't know. I thought the point of this Disney version this collaboration between AEG and the op was to get new people into Smash Up through the whole Disney license. So it's an odd choice because as for the game, uh, it's just weird. Like if you don't know there's a big geeky box, which means you need to know that it exists or you need to know board game geeks exist. And the Disney fans they are targeting don't. They're going to be confused by what are these things? It's weird. I, I for, expect somewhere in the manual it probably says what they're for. That's true. Like, if I, you don't have the big E box, just put these aside. And yeah, yeah, fair enough. That's true. I have not read the book. I, as for the game, it looks like Smash Up. Um, I won't be able to tell you if I where where it feels or how much I like it. Um, but I do want to know if it's changed because I honestly haven't played Smash Up since the first edition and haven't tried any of the expansions up till now. So this this is kind of a side thing for me. I I was not a huge fan of Smash Up. But I got this one mainly because I think my kids are going to love it. And I've not played it at all before, so I'm intrigued to give it a try. Now, the next game is the one I am actually most hyped about, and it is Mountains Out of Mole Hills. I, I probably would have totally skipped this game over based on the box and what it looks like. I would have thought it was a little kid's game. But this is a programmed movement abstract strategy game with fantastic table presence. You're moving your moles underground on a two-level player board where each square they move underground forms a mountain on the top board. 
I love program movement games. I like abstract strategy games. This is a very spatial one where if your hills get too tall, they topple and you're going to score points for hills you've started and then turn orders based on if your mountains are on the top. Like I have a feeling this one's going to be a big hit. And of all the games I'm mentioning here, I think you're going to hear thoughts on this one probably the soonest. Yeah, and Eyecatcher, to be sure, it's always nice when the box becomes a game component mm. as well. Uh, you know, sort of keeping everything, everything useful. I, I, it's yeah. just a great uh, thing. We can almost, I wonder if I can get to the point where I can go top five games where the box is part of the components. I know I own at least three. I can think of two even without, you know, just that we've reviewed in the past year or so. So, Oh, there you go. So <laughs> it's got to be even more than, well, oh, that Land of Gog even had that. Yeah, so, yeah. So that was the first yeah. last one I was thinking of. That might be an interesting topic. I, th I think we might be able to do that. One. All right. Next game I unboxed was Ven, a game that just wasn't quite what I expected. So I don't know what I was expecting. Like, I think with hues and cues, like when I saw it, I was like, oh, I know what this is. And I opened up I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. Where this just I thought, I don't know. I thought there was going to be more venting going on than there was. Um, the most unique thing here is the board. Um, there's there are three. There's two sets of them. Three color filters, I guess you'd call them. Like they look like the filters you put in front of like theater lighting to change the color of your backdrop. Um, you use those to make a three circle Venn diagram. And then you play in teams or cooperative placing cards with wonky art into the circles. Um, I, it's unique. Um, I, this is another one that I have no clue until I sit down and play this game. It could go either way. I, you, what really shocked me watching this unboxing was I was expecting a, a, a hard, Yes. plastic like a um uh you know translucent hard plastic uh like the miniatures in the in the disney yeah, yeah. Uh, game you know, you know but and while i i understand why they didn't want to fold them or roll them uh because they weren't hard but they wanted to lay them flat the box ended up being a lot of air <laughs> yes and and because they were floppy it felt worse than if they'd been a hard firm plastic uh ah, they wouldn't layer as well they'd be too thick that's Possibly. the only thing, I could think, right? Because if you're looking at um, what are those minis usually made of? I'm drawing a blank on the stupid word, but like if you were looking at like whatever quarter inch or eighth, eighth inch plastic, you're going three layers of that, and they're gonna not be flat. I think they kind of had to be, I guess. But like you and and the translucent obviously is just to get that color effect, but they're not they're, they're a little too opaque for that really to work as well as I'd want it to. I, yeah. It's weird. That's all I can say. Yeah. I honestly have no clue what I'm gonna think of this game. Um, I, I think my oldest daughter is actually going to really enjoy it. So we'll see. Um, last but not least was the Belgian beers race, <laughs> which I always want to call the Belgian beer race. And I don't know why it just sounds better in my head. I've got some worries about this one. Um, the most important thing being able to read things on the board from a distance, especially on my game table. Uh, the theme here is awesome. Like, like seriously, it's a board game about backpacking around Belgium, trying to visit as many breweries you can, tasting as many beers as you can, and cheersing people on the way. Like, there is not a, a much more Mo game out there. <laughs> like, Kanban, when I worked in, in lean manufacturing, was uh, like those two games. Put those two games together, and you have my life um, in my 30s. Um, it's got some interesting mechanics. You've got the breathalyzer track, and you got eating cheese to lower it, and if you drink too much, they won't let you on the bus anymore. Like there's some really interesting stuff here. I just really hope that busy board and small iconography doesn't completely kill it. Yeah. it And also it does not look like a game you want to play oh. while <laughs> drinking. Uh, it's, no. <laughs> it's got some weight to it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I we, we might have the longest game of the Belgian beer race ever. Yeah. I don't I know what I need to do. Oh, every year around Christmas, they put out this Belgian six pack. You can get it at the LCBO. I may have to get that in this game, but I think we saved the drinking till after yeah. somehow. Uh, probably a wise choice. It's it's not <laughs> even 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 ignoring the visual problems that you might yes. get into uh, with imbibing. Uh, it's uh, it's got some weight to it. But that's so, it. No no games played. But I did get some work done, and I did play with games. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Ah, uh, well, most obviously is get these games played right. Um, but along with this. We still have other stuff we're working on. Uh, the big one is finishing off the Ghost Betwixt. Um, I'm hoping to get through at least one mission. This will be mission four this Friday. Uh, originally, I was hoping to fit in mission five as well. Now, Board Game Geek users are saying that four and five are much shorter. But 
even with that, I think maybe instead we'll crack open one of these new games that I unboxed instead or break out Viticulture just to get that remember, refresher game in. Um, for Sunday, though, Ven and Mountains Out of Molehills are totally going over to Brenda's. So hopefully I'll at least be able to share my initial thoughts next week. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. So first off, a big welcome to Ron F., the latest Tabletop Bellhop patron. This is Ron from the Ron Talks Tabletop podcast that you should totally check out once you're done listening to us. Roger Malosh. Check out Roger's game design work at Roger, R-O-G-E-R, Dodger, D-O-G-E-R games. Thanks, Roger. Kevin Reno, thanks for not letting the Belgian beer race go missing on your trip back from Gen Con. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr., thanks as always for your support and being one of our most active Discord community members. Speaking of Discord, we invite you to join our growing Tabletop Bellhop community by heading to discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end and we got to lock those front doors. So the doors are closed. You can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Now, before you go, don't forget to tip your bellhop, patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.